it is my pleasure to bid you welcome to this week's Ancient Attire Lecture. And uh, this afternoon, we have a double performance. We have a lecture presented by two brilliant scholars. Um, it's uh, Dr. Agnes Garcia Ventura and Dr. Mireya Lopez Patran. And Dr. Mireya Lopez Patran is Associate Professor at the Department of Art History of the University of the Valencia in Spain. She specializes in Phoenician and Punic archaeology, and her research interests are in iconography, ancient Mediterranean art, uh, embodiment, rituals, and gender. Agnes Garcia Ventura is a Ramon y Jajal. I didn't say that very well, but I did try. A fellow at the University Autonoma in Barcelona, also in Spain. And Agnes' main areas of interest are gender studies and especially their application to Assyriology. And among many other things, I felt I wanted to highlight here uh, that Agnes is the co-organizer um, and the co-founder of a research network called Gender and Methodology in the Ancient Near East. It's known among friends as Gemane. Uh, and they meet roughly every two, every three years. Uh, and it's a very, very nice uh, network to be acquainted with. So if you're interested in that, you should uh, drop Agnes uh, an email later on. And this is also actually the reason uh, or the occasion for why I met Agnes and Mireya in the first place was these uh, Gemane meetings. So for me personally, they've been um, uh, a wonderful way to, to network and, and meet uh, colleagues. Um, of particular interest for our topic today, um, I would mention that Agnes and Mireya have published a couple of uh, things together. Uh, there is an article that was published in World Archaeology called Music, Gender and Rituals in, ancient in the Ancient Mediterranean, Revisiting the Punic Evidence, and also another co-authored uh, article um, called Performing Music in Punic Cartage, a Choroplastic Approach in an edited volume from 2016. And if you'd like to find the exact references for these, you can go to our website on the University of Oslo's uh, webpage and, and find them there. So this afternoon, Agnes and Mireya are going to talk to us uh, about dressed to sound, question mark, an approach to dress and attire of female musicians in Phoenician and Punic contexts. I'm looking very much forward to this. I'm going to unpin myself and pin Agnes and Mireya. Um, and then I am also going to, just a second, there we are, say thank you so much, both of you, for being here with us today. And we look forward to hearing your presentation and the floor is yours. Okay, Yane, thank you very much, first of all, for inviting us to give this lecture. It is, as you said, a pleasure. And we are going to present something that we, we are working for more than 10 years. So in order to fit on time, we, we just read our, our lecture and well, we hope you enjoy it. And can you see my screen now? Yes. yes, it's perfect. Okay, okay. so um, yes. First of all, we want to share with you the outline of the lecture. We will begin by making an introductory framework based on the basic chronogeographical features of the Phoenician Punic people and the state of the art of both music and dress, the two main topics of our research. Then we will present our case study the female musician pigwings. This topic will allow us to analyze the main theme of this presentation, which is the interaction between adornment, movement, and music, and the significance of the color garments. In the mid uh, 9th century BC, people from the Levant embarked on a diaspora that took them all over the Mediterranean, from the eastern coast of Cyprus and Crete to the Atlantic shores of the Iberian Peninsula and Northern Africa. These groups of men, women, and children settled permanently in enclaves throughout the Mediterranean, engaging in diverse interactions with local population that generated a wide range of heterogeneous and complex processes of cultural contact. From the 6th century BC onwards, Carthage, an old Phoenician city and an old Phoenician colony, 
began a process of commercial and economic expansion through the Central and Western Mediterranean that brought the material cultures and ideas of African people to these new lands. As a result of this historical process, the label Phoenician has been used to refer the diaspora dated between the 10th and the 6th centuries BC, while the label Puni alludes to a later period, lasting from the 6th century until the end of the Punic Wars in the 2nd century BC, during which the influence and hegemony of Carthage is clearly evidenced in the Central and Western Mediterranean. Consequently, the label Phoenician Punic is used to embrace a large of, uh, of social, economic, and cultural dynamics in the space and the time that share as their main unifying feature the use of the Phoenician language. <clears throat> After this introductory framework, based on the basic chronogeographical features of the Phoenician Punic people, let's move now on the one hand uh, uh, on, on the state of the art of dress, attire, and adornment to move on, on the other hand, uh, to, to analyze uh, music. Being these two main topics, we will discuss when concentrated on our case study. As you will see, we will discuss some key, some key issues and previous studies linked to each milieu. Let's begin with dress and attire. Unfortunately, the study of Phoenician clothes has not received much attention, even though we have to acknowledge that this panorama is changing in the last years, as we will show you in a while. In any case, the traditional lack of attention to this topic of research until very recently might be explained, probably, due to the lack of garments on the one hand and the interest related to other topics considered major ones, such as commercial, economic, or the political implication of the Phoenician and Punic diaspora. But, Curiously, the history of these people is intimately related to textiles. In fact, the etymology and origin of the term Phoenicia and Phoenicians presents a large consensus among scholars in affirming that Phoenicia derives from the Greek term phoenix, from the root phoenos, meaning red. This word can refer to different things, but it is widely assumed that it makes references to the purple color keeping in mind that the Phoenicians were famous for their purple dye produced from the local murex shellfish and other products. It is well known the Greek legend that ascribes the discovery of the purple dye to the Tyrian god Melkar. According to this legend, the god was walking on the beach of Tyre with the nymph Tyros when his dog chewed a murex shell and had its mouth colored purple. The nymph loved the color and requested a cloth dyed with it. The god answered her request by collecting the shells and producing, and producing the dye. This legend was so vivid in the consciousness of the Tyrians that they represented it on, on their coins, on the, uh, on the observe of some of which a dog munching on a murex uh, shell or a murex shell alone is represented. So much has been said about the mythic origins and about the industries of purple dyeing to the material remains, both from the Levant and the Western Mediterranean. But then approaching more specific studies on dress research has been mostly focused traditionally on typological proposals based on figurative materials, such as stili or terracotta. An example of the results of this kind of research is, this, is the chart you see on the slide, summarizing the research undertook by the Spanish scholar Maripaz San Nicolás Pedrat in 1983, based on terracotta figurines of Ibiza. Luckily, in the last years, the focus and objectives of research on dress and attire have broadened. In this direction, it is worth noting the recent compilation entitled Social Fabrics of Spinning and Weaving in the Phoenician Punic World, published in, in, 2020, in 2021, and you can see the cover on the slide. In this volume, published in the series Mediterraneo Punico, a supplement, a supplement to the well-known Revista di Studi Fenici, a comprehensive approach to the textile industry is offered. 
including studies on material culture, visual culture, and epigraphical sources. To this recently published volume, we also have to add other general and recent works of our colleagues, uh, Rosanna Pla or Anna Chiara Parizelli. Be as it may be, it is assumed that based mostly on iconography, female attire was based on a long tunic or pipelos associated with different coats like veils, polos, imation, or shawl, accompanied or not of jewelry. We will come back to this issue later on, but now let's briefly present previous studies on music, the second main topic of our presentation. Well, somehow longer and more nourished, if compared with the studies on Phoenician dress and attire, is the situation of the previous studies on music in this million. In the last 15 years, several scholars worked on the topic, being among them Anna Chiara Farizelli, one of the scholars also dealing with dress, Angela Belia, and also ourselves. And what is good news is that, uh, well, a token of good health of the field, is that these studies began to be included in general overviews on music in antiquity. For instance, in the first of the volumes, you have the cover in the slide, uh, the catalog of the EMAP project, the acrostics for the European Music Archaeology Project, uh, was a catalog published in 2018 and was titled Music and Sounds in Ancient Europe. And this volume included a section devoted to music cultures in antiquity, for example, Greek, Roman, Etruscan, and also Phoenician and Punic music. The same happened in the volume, the other, the other cover you have in the middle in the slide, Musicians in Ancient Choroplastic Art, published a bit before in 2016, or more recently in the workshop hosted by the Museo Arqueológico Nacional of Madrid, Spain, also covering a wide array of geographies and chronologies, including Phoenicians. All these previous studies show that Phoenician Punic music is well attested from indirect sources and remains of instruments, although, as you can imagine, these last ones are more scarce. However, all the remains of instruments are very scarce in number, it is worth noticing that there are remains of instruments of all almost types. As you can see on the bottom part of this slide, excavations have recovered several percussion instruments, such as metal cymbals, bells, rattles, as well as wind instruments or aerophones, in this case, more fragmentary and often difficult to identify with a specific instrument. Moreover, if we also take into account indirect sources, to this piece, we can add another percussion instrument, the hand drum, and a string instrument, the kitara. As examples of these indirect sources, you can see on the slide that we have images of musicians on several supports like bronze razors, metal bowls, stile, and also terracotta figurines. All of them are widespread across the Mediterranean and mostly relate to ritual contexts. This is a point we will consider later. But now let's move to the second section of our presentation, concentrating on one type of these sources, the terracottas of female musicians. Well, although terracotta figurines are also recorded in the Phoenician Levant, our studies have focused specifically on the specimens of the Western Mediterranean, mostly from the island of Ibiza and Carthage. In the map, you also see a third point, Cadiz, uh, because there, there is a specimen we took into account in previous studies, uh, and we also wanted to mention it here for some statistics we will show you below, but there are some problems linked to the context and access to this piece. Uh, therefore, we are not going to discuss this one in detail today. In any case, most of the specimens were recovered from funerary contexts. These figurines were located inside the funerary chambers and thus have a close relation to funerary rites. Stylistically, two chronological phases have been distinguished when dealing with terracotta figurines. The first one, an archaic phase, dated being with the 7th and the 5th centuries BCE. You can see a couple of examples of these specimens on the left-hand side uh, of this slide. Um, these are identified with oriental models from the areas of Beocia and Samos. Although local specimens as well as imports are also recorded. From the musical point of view, it is worth noticing that the figurines of female musicians of this archaic phase are exclusively holding these instruments you see here, hand drums. On the right side of the screen, we show you examples of the second phase, the figurines uh, that are dated between the fifth and the third centuries BCE. In this phase, we have types from Sicily and Magna Greece models. From the musical point of view, it is worth noticing 
that the types of instruments played by the figurines are expanded. They play hand drums as well, but also wind <coughs> instruments and also kitaras, as we will see later on. Technically, the figurines are mold made using univalve and bivalve molds and hence standardized. The size of the figurines is between 18 and 30 centimeters and it makes it them easy to hold and to touch, but most of them cannot be standing by themselves. Most of them are hollow at the rear and it has been suggested as the, that they might be stick to some kind of support. So they were designed to be seen only by the front. Besides, some of them present a hollow on the heads as if the figurines were designed to be hung, perhaps by buildings, jewels, or tombs, as you can see also here, this, this hole on the, on the bottom part. Taking now a closer look at the musical instruments these figurines hold, those usually labeled membranophones, that is percussion instruments, such as the hand drums you see here in the slide, are the most numerous. It is worth noting that this is the case not only of terracottas, but also for images engraved in stele or embossed in metal bowls or bronze razors. In the slide, you can see the three different ways of holding this instrument, of different size in each case. First, in front of the body and perpendicular to it, attached to the body and parallel to it, and finally, the biggest one on your right-hand side, where we see the hand drum put beside the body but not in contact to it. This last one is an iconography that has been widely attested in clay figurines, especially from the Western Mediterranean and related to Greek types. They display more sense of movement because they present a veil that is spread out as if it were a recreation of the visual effect of movement. And they are also modeled with a bent knee. So it seems they are kind of dancing. We'll come later to this issue as well. Moving now to aerophones, that is to wind instruments, two kinds are recovered from excavations written shells on the one hand, and on the other hand, those often referred as aulos in secondary literature. For the latter, we prefer to keep a more generic term, pipes, rather than aulos. Um, and we do this because we do not know the mouthpiece of these instruments, therefore we are cautious with the word we use to label them. As you can see in the slide, double pipes are well represented in the terracottas. However, we don't have examples of terracottas holding triton shells. So in the terracottas, we are also going to concentrate just on one of these instruments. The third type of instrument attested in our terracottas are cordophones, that is string instruments, more specifically, kitaras. Cordophones are well attested iconographically in the Levant. The most famous examples are the images on the bowls with depictions of lyres, in the specimens, specimens sorry, of Idalion, Sparta, and Olympia. If we move to the West, terracotta figurines are scarce, and they always hold the Hellenistic kitara, that is a simplified version of the previous standard or concert kitara of the classical period. This Hellenistic kitara was developing during the 4th century BCE. It is interesting to notice that the simplification of the instrument involves changes in size and shape, which are especially visible in this terracotta. And while kitaras were in the classical period mainly played by males, after the simplification, we begin to find mainly females represented playing them. It seems then that this technical change also leads to a change in the social and maybe symbolic consideration of this instrument, this kitara. After this overview of the musical instruments of the terracottas, Let's move now to the third part of this lecture. In this part, we will turn our attention to the variety of the attire that present our figurines. We have made a basic classification system based on body garments, hair and head decoration, and jewelry. Regarding the body garments, we can differentiate between the dresses of the first archaic phase and those of the second phase with a Greek more style. The figurines of the archaic phase that, uh, as Agnes uh, mentioned, are dated between the 7th and the 5th centuries BC, wear a long tunic, whether with a long or short sleeve, and some decoration at the bottom, possibly imitated embroidered fabrics. In addition, they can also present a veil that can be observed in the sinking of the waist appreciated in the image of the center of the slide. The figurines of the second phase are dressed in the Greek style garments. They were whether a peplos uh, or a chiton, uh, a kind of body length tunic. Furthermore, some of them present 
a imagine a kind of mantle or, um, or warp worn over the other garments. Although it is impossible to distinguish on the figurines, it is assumed that the imation was a heavier drape that played the role of a cloak. Um, as to the hair, some of them have wavy, curly, and long hair falling over the, the breast in two or three plates on each side. On the contrary, others have their hair tied together. What they all have in common is the existence of some head decoration. None of them are modeled with uncovered head. The vast majority present a veil subjected by a calatos, a kind of high uh, headdress or crown named after the Greek as a basket in the form of a, ta of a top hat used to hold bull or fruit, often using an ancient Greek card as a symbol of abundance and fertility. These baskets were made by weaving together reeds or twig. The figurine on the right of the screen presents a calatos. Another kind of head decorative element is the polos, a medium high cylindrical crown that normally presents some decoration like rosettes or ge geometrical motif. Both crowns um, were probably made of garments, possibly wool. Last, a, a small number of specimens were diadems or hairbands, although they are difficult to distinguish. Moving to the last set of objects, the musician wears jewelry and they are abundantly represented. Necklaces in groups of two or three with pendants are clearly attested. Bracelets and earrings too. Luckily, remains of jewelry are well attested across the Mediterranean. They are made of gold, but other materials were also identified. This is the case of glass paste or semi precious stones like carnelian. Needless to say, the implications of wearing jewelry are manifold. Here, we want to draw attention to one issue, often overlooked, the physical consequences of wearing heavy jewelry and moving around with it habitually. Amy Genser, in a study of the skeletal remains of elite women from the Near Syrian period, that is first half of the first millennium BC, buried at Nimrud, points out that they were sedentary and suffered joint diseases. To interpret this, cir this circumstance, Gansel proposes that, and I quote, this could have been related to the heavy jewelry and ornamented robe they wore. It also implies that they were overweight by modern Western standards, a characteristic that might have been related to ancient cultural preferences for voluptuousness, end of quote. It does not seem we can apply this hypothesis of sedentary and overweight bodies to our musicians, but the proposal of the physical consequences of wearing heavy clothes and jewelry is without any doubt one we can take here into account. After this overview of the musician terracottas focusing on style, manufacture, musical instruments, and also dress and attire, and before moving to the fourth and last section, uh, of this communication and the interaction between clothes, body decoration, movement, and music, let us share with you a summary uh, through these graphics using the slide of some of the results of the studies we have been developing these last years, and which also summarize some issues we presented so far. First, as you may have noticed, the imagery of the musician is almost exclusively female. So they are females, and in the Levantine chorop choroplastic production, this is quite clear. Second, the area with the highest statues is Carthage with 47 specimens. In Ibiza, there are documented only 18, and that's also <laughs> significant. Third, the most represented instrument is the hand drum, then the double pipe, and only in the third place, the kitara. In what follows, we will see that the fact that this imagery is exclusively female and that percussion instruments are the most numerous has a significant implication to understand the interaction between dress, attire, and musical performance. In this direction, it has been suggested that the figurines playing hand drums were representing the Phoenician and Punic goddess Astarte, and that she played drums in order to ward off evil spirits, not only because this instrument is an attribute of this divinity, but also because the sound of percussion instruments might have purifying properties, and that is why the instruments themselves were deposited in tombs. 
However, we should avoid the automatic identification of female figurines with deities because the evidence available is insufficient. The images could be either goddesses or real women. Considering only the divinization option is the result of a trend which was involved in the 19th century, dismissing the possibility that ancient women might have held real earthly power. Thus, we consider them to be mortal women, perhaps with a specific role. In any case, people of high rank, like priestesses, because in many societies having a religious function requires musical knowledge. And as we have seen, the rich dress and attire also points out in this direction. Helping to sustain this interpretation, we refer to a tomb in Carthage containing 200 drums. It has been identified as the tomb of a priestess. In the same direction, in Putzas Moulins, one of the figurines was found in the Hippogeum 13, and this kind of tomb is considered to be exclusive of wealthy people. Moreover, we argue that double pipes and hand drums, the instrument represented in our terracotta, eh, are associated to mourning too. The specialization of women as mourners is linked to their association with activities related to the maintenance, creation, and recreation of life. <coughs> Seeing death as the last step of life, and bearing in mind that it is women who give birth and who take exclusive care of children in many societies, it is easy to accept that they should be responsible for the public ritual of lamenting the dead. Mourning is usually in hands of mature human because they have experience in looking after people, but also due to the fact that presumably they have already had children and they cannot be contaminated by the disease. Perhaps due to the fact that they are mature and experienced, they are able to express their feelings and opinions in such public ceremonies. Mourning is an empowering ritual that challenges and manipulates issues of social importance. Thus, women might take advantage of the laments to materialize their emotions. In fact, it is not by chance that the figurines are all veiled, probably pointing out to adult age of these musicians. However, where the idea of movement is more explicitly portrayed, and we were pointing out to this before, is in the terracotta you see in this slide. The veil looks like a wing, and it is said that this way of representing the veil is reproducing this idea of movement. All figurines playing double pipes present their veils in this form of wings. However, this is not the case for those with hand drums, as we have already seen. From the three possible ways of holding the hand drum, this one shows a livelier gesture. They are more dynamic and kinetic if compared with the others. It seems then that the figurines with these veils evoke the idea of dancing while playing music. And again, the association of women with dance is ubiquitous in several sources, as for example, the Old Testament, and also Greek and Roman authors such as Lucian and Apuleius. All of them report sensual and sexual dances performed by women with percussion instruments inciting ecstatic dancing. Although we are highly skeptical of any exclusive association between sensuality, sexuality, and women in light of recent gender and body theories, a connection between dancing and women in general terms does seem clear. In Tarros, in Sardinia, for instance, a memorial stone has been found in one of the cemeteries that may be dated to between the 5th and 4th centuries BC, and that shows a scene of four dancing individuals. This is the one you see uh, in the left-hand side of the of this slide. The three women appear to be naked, while the one man is wearing a skirt and a bull's mask. All of them are dancing around a phallus-like pillar stone. Eastern metal caps, dated to between the 9th and 6th centuries BC, also depict dances performed mainly by women, while another representation of young female dancers has been carved on the so-called Eshmoon platform in the Phoenician sanctuary of Bostani Sheikh, you can see the image on the right hand side of this slide. Another issue to take into account when analyzing the interaction between movement, music, and body decoration is the effect of playing musical instruments wearing not only veils, but jewelry and different types of hairdo. This would have had both bodily and sonorous implications, influencing then the musical performance. In other words, we suggest that there were other sounds like jingle of jewelry or the movement of fabrics that accompanied those produced by the musical instruments. Moreover, as said before, heavy clothes and jewelry might have conditioned the speed and the facility or difficulty to perform certain movements. Therefore, we have also to take into account the expertise of these women playing music and probably dancing with all this attire. 
In what follows, and as a kind of conclusion, we want to highlight one of the topics of this lecture series, which is the consideration of vestimentary codes from a multisensorial perspective. We have already shown how decorated bodies and their movements create hearing effects that accompany the music. Now we are going to shed some light on the visual aspect of the garments. Most of the figurines, unfortunately, have lost all traces of their painting, but luckily some of them still retain traces of red, ochre, black, blue, yellow, and green. Some of them still preserve remains of clay washes too, mainly white. The colored areas of the face, the colored areas are the face, hair, dresses, and jewelry. Some patterns have been recorded in the use of colors. Brown for hair, black for eyes and eyebrows, red for lips and cheeks, and yellow for ornaments, perhaps trying to imitate gold jewelry. Thus, it is likely that the coloring of, of the figurines responds to specific choices made to highlight significant parts of the musician's bodies and their decoration. To illustrate all these issues, here we concentrate on the figurine you see on, on the slide. It is a figurine 125 following the, the catalog of Zora Sherif, published in 1997. This figurine is from Carthage, and as you can see, it's extraordinarily well preserved. Found in the Duimet Cemetery and dated to the 6th century BC, it is known as the hand drum goddess due to its rich decoration. The figurine holds a hairband or a, 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 holds a hairband, sorry, decorated with blue and black flowers. The, the hair, color, uh, colored in red, is wavy, curly, and long, falling over the rest in three plates on each side. The face is decorated with four red circles, two on each cheek, one on the forehead and the other on the chin. Black eyebrows and red lips complete the facial colors. The musician has a necklace made of three chains. Two are red and the one in the middle comprises red and light blue pendants and also is holding two black painted bracelets on each wrist. The body has an horizontal uh, braid with black triangles and its colors alternate between red and light blue. The waist is con concave and is formed by rectangles and vertical stripes also painted in red and blue. The rest of the dress follows a pattern of a long red strip containing four red and black rosettes. The colored patterns of this figurine book would make reference to the multicolored fabrics, probably linen cloth, decorated with colored wool, embroideries, or woven patterns. According to uh, Elena Soriga, this, color, this colorful textile were considered, and I quote, a luxury good achieved not only by the use of purple, but also by the growing number of shining dyes that gave to the garments a lustrous, glimmering, and vivid aspect, end of quote. In this sense, we argue that colored dresses also participate actively in the creation of a multisensorial experience, and seeing the shiny garments with movement would have created an aesthetic experience. In addition, the interest in showing embroidered garments may be connected to issues of status, especially in relation to the preeminence of red as a color of the royalty and priesthood. But it can only be associated to the powerful significance of this color in relation to its substance and shine, attributes related to the presence of the divine and the afterlife. It is worth noting the visual impact and the contrast between the red painted dots of the face of the figurine uh, with, the white wash of the, with the white wash of clay on the rest of the face. With this, with this last example, we want to conclude by reiterating the potentialities of studying these figurines as proof of, this, of, of the existence of a specialized female musicians that participated actively in the funerary realm in close connection to mourning practices. In addition, it is also important to focus on their skills as performers and the difficulties of playing music and even dancing with the array of dresses and adornments that they wear. Thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you so much. This was absolutely brilliant. Um, thank you is, for bringing these female musicians to life for us as, as a, a multi-sensorial uh, experience. And uh, I hope you will join me, uh, audience, in, in giving them a, a Zoom applause. Um, so here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Shani. <laughs> Thank you. And um, we have time now for, uh, for questions and comments. Um, so go ahead, uh, please. And we are not that many today, so you can just raise your hand, um, your human hand, but you can also raise your, your Zoom hand if you prefer that, or write to me in the chat and let me know that you would like to, uh, to ask a question or make a comment. Um, I would actually like to get us started, maybe a little bit just picking up on this last uh, um, conclusion of yours with a, a specialized group of female musicians. So I was wondering um, the statistics you showed us about the gender uh, distribution with only, was it only 3% male musicians in, in the iconography? Uh, do you think that represents uh, a sort of real, historical um thing that that being a, a musician or a dancer was sort of a a prerogative for for women in this particular time and culture or do you think it's just sort of a a mishap of representation that it that it's if that makes sense and i know it's really hard to um to answer that but i also know that you must have given it some thought uh Mireya? Okay, yeah, I, I begin then. <laughs> yeah, Mireille was also um, asking for some patience because he, he got a cold. So I begin and then she will continue. Yeah, I have been thinking about this and, well, we don't have any evidence to confirm uh, what's going on here. This is the only evidence, let's say, we have. But then at the same time, we also think that there is an over-representation of these females in this context. So. Uh, we will opt for this second possibility you were saying that. So it's mm. not that we have only specialized female musicians here, but what is chosen in this specific context to be portrayed and represented. And the same happens, for example. So if we have a look, if we compare, and for the chronologies, uh, is unavoidable uh, with Greek and Roman sources and other representations, um, for some of the instruments, we have exclusively male uh, players or uh, an overwhelming majority of male players, for example, for the wind instruments, for the aulos in certain periods, you have lots of male players and no female players. And it's considered an instrument that is for males and a specialized instrument that um, is even an instrument you have to perform with virtuosity and in this kind of, um, of, of different context where you have to show that you are really a, a good musician and a specialized musician. And then it's surprising that when they are importing these Greek models, you have these females playing the same instrument. So maybe it's an overrepresentation of women for some reason, for the context, for example, for the mourning issue, for the funerary context, because it's surprising. If you compare here, it's just the opposite panorama, what you have in the, in the Greek sources with the, with the case, sorry, of the uh, double pipes or laulos, for example, here is so clear. Uh, and with the other instruments, we can discuss it, but with the kind of the laws, I think it's quite clear. Very interesting. Uh, yeah, and I, well, if, if I can add something, it will be very interesting to have the clear context of, of, the, of, the, of the terracotta figurines with the tombs, with the exact tombs, and to know if the deceased were male or female, no? that will be super great. But unfortunately, it's not happening because most of these figurines are recovered from all excavations. And we do, we do not know if these figurines were located inside male or female tombs. Yeah. However, there are some uh, recent excavations that uh, we know perfectly well who were buried there. And they have uh, musical instruments, not figurines, but musical instruments like the, the, the metallic handrails, Agnes uh, put on, the, on, the, on the, one of the uh, slides, was recovered from a female uh, tomb. And also some um, be uh, bells, metallic bells, are also recovered from female tombs. So, so 
um, representation is something no, uh, to keep in mind, but also the the the, the proper uh, instruments no, uh, points to this direction. With with at the moment we do not have a male tone with an instrument with a, a musical instrument. That is that is so interesting and so, in a way. When you say that, I'm thinking, yes, but of course, instruments are also gendered. I mean, you couldn't possibly have a unisex instrument, I mean, by all means. <laughs> uh, no, but that's fascinating. Thank you. Uh, Megan Cifarelli, please go ahead. Hi, everyone. Thank you guys for that wonderful talk. And thank you, um, Anne, for this wonderful series that you're doing. Um, I have a couple of questions. I mean, to me, the, the difference between the Greek and Roman imagery and what you're finding is so interesting. Um, and to me, a lot can turn on that. And um, I, I'm interested to think about that in terms of the differences in gender expression between these different cultures. The other question I have is, and you, and you may have said it and I missed it, is it your belief or understanding that these figures represent human women or mythological or divine women? Because when you compare them to satyrs, obviously that's not a thing in the real world. So we know we're in this, this supernatural environment. What do you think about with respect to these, these female figures? Um, um, I, well, they are obviously related to these um, re ritual or religious uh, elements, but um, we prefer no, to, to think in, in real women that in goddesses, no? because in that way, it's, it's, a, it's a political uh, focus, absolutely. And I think Agnes uh, is agree with me. We would rather think that they are women or at least representing a certain uh, female uh, real sphere than goddesses, because it's always, it's this circular argument. No? Uh, uh, so, well, it's, uh, I don't know if Agnes wants to add something else. Uh, yes, well, first of all, Megan, thanks very much yes, for coming. Yes. It's a pleasure to see you yes. here uh, <laughs> and thanks for your questions. And uh, well, as Miriam was saying, we were thinking about this and I, I think what we also propose is a kind of reaction, if I may say it in this way, uh, to what we have uh, seen in previous studies, where there is not this question on the table. It's just assuming they are goddesses. That's it. And then, uh, as is assumed they are goddesses, without an evidence to say they are goddesses, it's not that we are assuming they are real women without an evidence, but at least uh, we can put both options on the table. And then, uh, as Mireya said, if you have both options on the table and you have these other evidences uh, in the tombs, for example, with the actual instruments and so on and so forth, uh, we propose that maybe also to, to make this, this pendulum issue going from one part to the other, we propose to think on the direction of uh, real women, mortal women specialized in this milieu. So also because it, it gives uh, some chance to discuss other things. I, I, I agree with you. I think it's, it, there's this an interesting mythological space between real women mm. And, and divine women that is um, in, in the Greek world, the realm of the Maenads or the Bacchae. So, so yeah. that it, it's an interesting role that real women can put themselves in, at least intellectually, um, where they're not necessarily bound by some of the strictures of that, that m women encounter in daily life. It's just really interesting, and I love what you guys are doing. Thank you, Thank Megan. You, Megan. And, and, and we like to, like, you were mentioned this idea of uh, there's something in between goddesses and real women, no? which are mm. this mythological or semi-mythological beings. But um, probably it's more easy to follow these figures in, 
in other uh, cultures, but in Phoenician and Punic culture, we do not have uh, uh, written sources or even visual sources that points out to this semi-mythical, uh, semi-divine area. No, so more we are, <laughs> we push more to the uh, real. <laughs> Yeah, that's another issue we, we always, when we are dealing with these materials, we mentioned Greek and Roman sources. We mentioned the Old Testament. Uh, of course, we have to go to these written sources, uh, but with uh, caution, because it's, it's not uh, the same what we are discussing here and the limitation of the written sources in the Phoenician and Punic context for this kind of studies is clear also in this case. But I will think about this well in between <laughs> possibility. <laughs> that's no. That's we have in, in Phoenician and Punic culture as a like, kind of semi mythical who are the um, the ancestors, but they are always considered as uh, male. Interestingly, without any 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 proof, eh? any material or uh, textual proof. No, they the but uh, there's some people in between but uh, always define as male or male-like. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Jessica uh, Hughes, I think you had a, a comment as well. Hello there. Yes, sorry, I couldn't find my Zoom hands. Um, but thank you ever so much. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, I'm also interested in sort of comparisons and contrasts with the Greek and Roman traditions. Um, I've started looking a little at the, the South Italian vase, the ceramic material that's found in tombs and, you know, trying to make sense of, of music in tombs. And, you know, your, your discussion really gave me some possible insights and questions that I'm going to be able to ask of that material. So thank you very much. Um, my question, I think, it, well, probably quite simple, really, but I just wanted to know a bit more about the archaeological context of the figurines. Um, apologies if I've missed something, but I just, um, I, I was quite interested in wh whether you found things in sanctuaries and as votive offerings and what kind of interpretations you'd give of <coughs> context. Um, yes. Well, Jessica, it's, it's nice to meet you because I'm a huge fan of your work. So. Oh. <laughs> well, thank you. Lovely to meet you. <laughs> and regarding the context, they are mostly from um, uh, funerary. They are recovered from tombs, no? from these fu big funerary chambers. They were deposited there sometimes um, in the in the in the in the archaeological records they they describe that they were at the entrance at the threshold of the tombs no but that's all there's nothing more to say so and others are found in uh, secondary votive deposits but there are very 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 few these these specimens most of them funerary record and not um, domestic context. That's very interesting. Well, perhaps because um, the Phoenician and Punic archaeology have, has not a long tra tradition of uh, domestic architect um, archaeology. But yes, 95% uh, uh, related to, to the yeah, funerary archaeology. Okay, oh, that's so interesting because I kind of expected um, with comparisons with the sanctuaries in, say, Italy, that the, some of the figurines would be would be votive figurines. Um, okay, no, that, oh, I'll have to think about that some more. So just one more quick question. Do you have anything to recommend for people um, to read about the specific funerary context? Um, you know, maybe maybe you could um, tell us some of your publications or another maybe a, like earlier publication that we could look at because I've, I've been selfish because I want to find out more in relation also to the, to the if, material, but... if you want to do a general overview you can yeah. check the uh, Oxford Handbook of Phoenician and Punic Archaeology and well, yeah. there's a chapter uh, there's two chapters one of funerary ritual of and another of uh, religion re Phoenician religion so that's a starting point and then you in that reference in both references you can find more uh, literature no but that will be a basic and easy starting point for this yeah. topic yeah yeah, yeah. wonderful thank you very much for the talk both of you thank you You're welcome. Thank you. I've, I'm going to allow myself to jump in here because I had a related question to Jessica's, which is um, I'm 
as you know, I'm I'm interested in funerary or mortuary ritual myself. Uh, and and one of the things that I always find really interesting is how much we can say about access to the tomb also after the burial, uh, because it sometimes gives us a hint of whether any ritual artifacts that are found in a funerary context are only related to the time of the of the burial and funerary, or if there's also some kind of extended ritual activity going on also uh, beyond the, the funeral itself. And, and I, I have to go and read those chapters in the handbook that you recommended, Maria, but just to, to take a sneak peek <laughs> into that now, do we know anything about a traffic in the tomb in a, in a Phoenician Punic context? Yes, well, th th there are different kinds of tombs, no? There's the simple pit where you can put the, where you put the, the funerary urn and that's all, you never open the pit again. Mm -hmm. And you have the funerary chambers where several tombs were located. And there are, uh, obviously, they are family of uh, tombs, probably, and they open them and they are adding new tombs. So they, they put all the uh, former tombs or the former bones at the bottom mm -hmm. uh, and they are adding more and more and more tombs. Uh, but uh, yeah, that happens especially in, in Western Mediterranean. In, in Eastern Mediterranean, it's not that, that common. Okay. So there's a traffic, yes. Yeah. yeah. There we go. <laughs> tombs and people visiting the, the cemeteries. Yeah. But no, but that's, that's so interesting because, of course, we can only speculate, but at least when there is a traffic, when the tomb isn't sort of just closed and sealed off, uh, at least we can speculate that a mourning ritual or any kind of ritual performance could also be performed for the benefit of the dead at, at, at a sort of more long-term period rather than just the time of inhumation, uh, which of course adds something to, or possibly adds something to our understanding of these uh, of these uh, musicians and, and their role. It's... Yeah, no, yeah. And... Probably no. We 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 just publish in, in other volumes and with other colleagues the idea of women and well family, no, re, 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 going to the tomb every now and then and celebrating some remembrance uh, rituals, no. And it's with not only music and dancing but also food, no, drinking because we have all these material records, no. So yeah, yeah. and and there you you get like an overlap both with what we see in in the Levant, uh, and, and of course also in the Greco-Roman world when it comes to, to mortuary practices. Yes. So interesting. Yes. But um, you showed us an image of this beautiful disc with depictions on it. It was the, the material that you showed us that wasn't the figurine. Um, um, I think you may probably, it's, it's a metal bowl. Yes. yes. Bowl? It looked like a, a decoration in the inside of a bowl. Yeah. Yes. This and one, it was perhaps? yeah, exactly the one where there was a close up of the of the double pipes, or was that another one? Yeah, in the, in we a previous slide, one. I think there oh, was yes. only one. That's yeah. right. Yeah. So, uh, what Oops, what sorry. can, what can you tell us about the context of of this ob object because it's it's the one that's a little bit different from the figurines. Yeah. Well, Agnes, do you want to say something or? Yeah. You begin. You are the expert, so it's clear no, that Mireya is the main expert. <laughs> so no, you begin, then is... I can add something about the music, about the musical ensembles, because there is something here. Yeah, regarding the object, it's very interesting because this all these metal balls are assumed that they are Phoenician, Phoenician made, although we do not have any metal ball found in Phoenicia. So all the balls are located in Cyprus, Etruria. Greece, but according to the uh, Greek sources, no, they were Phoenicians who made these metal bones, and they are a, lu a luxury object. No, they are related to um, yes, they are located in luxury context. In but outside, always of the Phoenician and Punic uh, sphere. No, always related to non-Phoenician uh, cultures. Yeah, what, I, what I said that I was going to add something because, uh, well, you see that Mireia is the expert on the context and Phoenician and Punic sources. And we were working together for the musical issue that is more or less the, uh, the milieu where I, I am also moving. And also these materials are interesting because, well, with the terracottas, it's quite difficult 
to make any hypothesis about an ensemble, a musical ensemble, who is playing together with whom, uh, which instruments are playing together with each other, and so on and so forth. And also these materials have been used to talk about the so-called Phoenician orchestra. Well, this word orchestra has been used in this context. Uh, I also prefer ensemble in this case. Uh, and well, some of the hypotheses is, well, you have one of each kind of instrument, maybe it's like a simple representation of the group, just not to represent the whole group. Maybe it's a trio, it's, it's just a group of three musicians playing together and then it makes sense. It's also something that has been discussed in this case of this kind of marching musician ensembles also working together. So it's also interesting from this point of view because it's the only context where we have some information to this regard, yeah. how to, to build up these musical ensembles. It's, it's a really, really amazing object. Uh, mm. Selena, please go ahead. Yeah, there was one other image of the three musicians. And in that, there, uh, it was sort of like the bowl, but in the, the three, and only the, in that one, it looked like the drummer was clearly, that yes, the drummer is clearly moving, but the other two are not. So that was very interesting also. Mm. Mm. To also the well when we were discussing thanks for uh, for your remark uh, when we were also discussing which figurines have this bent knee or not so here is clear that this is not only the instrument what is also conditioning this but also uh, the kind of representation and yes uh, percussion instruments are more linked also to this movement here but then in the other ones in terracottas we have the double pipes as the ones with more movement so that's also interesting. Maybe that's also something to do with the conventions of this representation, of course, not only on the on the real performance. But that's a good that's a good remark. Thank you. I was oh, and, Selena, please go ahead. No, and I also uh, just want I forgot to say this was an absolutely fascinating talk, and I thank you very, very much for it. So thank you. Thank you Thanks much. for your kind words. But I was actually also thinking on the topic of movement because this is this is very far removed from from Phoenicia and Punic culture but there is at the National Museum in, in Denmark in Copenhagen there is a, a scholar who's been doing studies on Bronze Age dancing um, um, there is this find of a of a, a woman who's who's was dressed in this uh, almost a string skirt with a big bronze disc on her her belly and then with like a crop top and 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 what he and his colleagues have been looking into is how this particular type of dress, which is it's quite a small dress, it doesn't cover very much, um, but uh, how it would have been very uh, striking for for exactly for moving and jumping and how a bronze disc in the middle of the body would really attract light and and shadow and and and. And it, I think this is a really interesting way uh, to go when studying musicians and dancers. And, and you're already touching upon this with your research, which is so fascinating. And then so I sort of had the echo of that Danish Bronze Age context in the back of my head. Um, and then I was looking at your beautiful figurines and thinking that it must have been incredibly hard for them to dance in this kind of dress. And especially with those uh, woolen, uh, uh, the Kalo, Kaloton. Kalatos. 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 Yes. Uh, so do you think that's true, that their movements would have been very limited by, by the kind of dress they're wearing, at least some of the ones, especially the, the later period ones that we see seem to be quite sort of uh, wrapped up in jewelry and hats and, and fabric? Well, maybe it's, it's more a matter, well, of course, it's a limitation, but it's also a matter of expertise. Right, so I, I think it, um, it's something we have been also thinking about, that it is also a matter of expertise first, as musician, of course, and you need a certain expertise as musician to be able also to move and to dance at the same time. Yes. And then you need the expertise on both, <laughs> the, on the musical instrument and a good knowledge of the musical instrument and also of the dance and all the, the whole performance to be able to do this with the whole. Uh, heavy weight you are wearing at the same time. So it makes sense. So I think yeah. expertise is also a key here. That's also why, uh, because many times when we are dealing with uh, music in several contexts of, uh, of this ancient world, 
and we are dealing with percussion instruments, many times it is course is also, well, it's a simple instrument, you don't need uh, any training or it's quite easy to learn it. And then it's also to counter this kind of discourse. So you need a training and you need a good knowledge. Absolutely. Because the performance is not only a technical issue, it's not our point of view many times of what means playing a specific musical instrument, but the whole performance together. So mm. that's also something we try to counter with this with these yeah. examples. No, that's a very, very good point. That that makes sense. Thank you. Uh, Megan, please go ahead. Yes, and anything that limits movement or parameterizes it amplifies it visually. Hmm. So I, in, in my mind and in my own work, um, the, these women are not only very, very skilled and probably their bodies are modeled in a particular way that allows them to perform these actions and these rituals, but it's also incredibly conspicuous. Um, it, it's, it's the sort of equivalent, I think, in terms of the visual culture of seeing a man with a sword buckled at, this, at his side because that speaks of training, it speaks of a particular kinds of exercise, it speaks of abstract values like valor or um, masculinity. And I, I see that operating here with these, these women um, and, and the ones that you mentioned in the, the Danish museum. I know exactly the, those skirts that are strings with what we would call wind chimes. You know, and as, as these women moved, these are not clothing to cover their body. It, it's a musical instrument that they're embodying. It's really fantastic. And I think you do have that happening here. Really great. And that's, that's a beautiful way to put it, that it's a musical instrument that you're embodying. Thank you. Yes. Uh, and, and very good points. It, and I think it, it ties a little thread to the lecture we had last week where um, Mary Harlow, or not last week, but last time, it's a few weeks ago, um, but Mary Harlow talked about sort of wearing these um, very sort of uh, large uh, pieces of fabric as a garment and how, I mean, even just walking around in your everyday life in that kind of, of garment is is something that really requires skill and practice and and poise and and, and also a lot of sort of studied changing around of the garment on your body and adapting your body to the garment almost entirely throughout the day in order to to be able to do what you do uh, which of course also requires a lot of attention and skill so very yeah. so interesting yeah and and, it, in, and if we add the the colored garments it, it is still more more um visual no and more aesthetic no so yeah yeah that's uh, it's like a it's a kind of ephemeral art, no? <laughs> Dancing and music with this garment. It's, it's yeah. yeah. And as you said, even with a garment that had a shine. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to point out to this so that um, also at the very end, uh, when Mireille was pointing out to the shine, that's really important. So it's not only color, but the shine of this color. So the um, what you're doing with light at the same time. And it also is related to the... Um, raw materials of some of the musical instruments as well. So we can also think that there is something here going on. And we have seen that the color of the hand drums, for example, in the terracotta, so there is color there. So there is something going on, on the colors and shine of the dress, but also on, of the instruments and on the mm -hmm. different materials building this, these instruments as well. And we have, as I said, we have no information, for example, on the materials of the double pipes. Maybe there are some um, metallic pieces there, I don't know. They also help to have more shiny instruments or decorated instruments. We don't have this, not yet. Yeah, not. But, but the terracottas, no? I, we, we showed you before, some hand drums are painted in red. Mm. No? It's like adding more um, value to these instruments. No? So that will be not only the, the metallic ones, or, but also no, the the five, the five, yeah, the, the five uh, fibers, fibers, no, are were painted, no, so mm. it gives more, yeah, and, and more also, value. 
And well, you see also here, for example, in the in this slide you have here now in this slide, okay. uh, well, yeah, no. I, the other one. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, I was taking mm. advantage of this. Uh, with Mira, the, 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 the red uh, one, yeah, you can see here the, the hand ramp. Mm. Yeah, it's painted in in red. Yeah, yeah. Which and one? Also, not the one with the kitara, just to show that. Well, some of these instruments were also highly decorated. So again. This one, for example, is clear that yeah. you have here a decorated instrument also is, is well, expensive instruments, not only just for the use of the instruments, but decorated ones. Mm. Yeah. Well, we're approaching the end of our time, unfortunately. So if anyone has a question or a, a comment to make, this is, uh, this is your last chance. <laughs> Um, this this has been incredibly uh, interesting. Thank you both so much. Um, and um, before I let you go, all of you, I send you off to have a lovely weekend. I'm just going to uh, do a little bit of advertisement for our um, for our uh, next lecture in the series, which is exactly two weeks uh, from today, which will also be our last. Uh, lecture this uh, this series and it is uh, Dr. Salvatore Gaspa from Rome who's going to talk about dress adornment and the material language of power um, on royal textiles in Assyria. So please do join us for that if you can. It's Friday uh, 16th December and it's 3 p.m. Uh, Central European time as always. And then Agnes and Mireya, thank you so much for your excellent presentation and a really really interesting discussion and thank you to all of you who who came and join us and have a lovely weekend thank you